Hello, welcome to the Bible Baptist Church. We're glad that you decided to join us today. We hope you'll sit back and relax and absorb the truth of God's Word. And we pray that you'll be stronger as a Christian and that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that today, right here in this service, you'll trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior.
Tears. 
I know I'm not going to get all the way through this message, but uh, I want to get it set up if I can, and not with some of the funny things that I've got, but uh, there are some funny things about marriage. If you've been married very long, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and if you're not married, you probably will get married one day, or maybe you've been married and your spouse has already passed by the way, but maybe you're here today and you've gone through a divorce. Maybe you've gone through several divorces. You know what? When you're dealing with relationships, God's Word has a lot to say no matter what relationship you're in. And I, I want you to know that because it's extremely important that you listen. Wherever you're at in life, apply these truths. They're necessities. A marriage can't be the way that it ought to be. And don't just think because somebody has stayed together that their marriage is wonderful because there's a lot of people that have stayed together and marriage was miserable. Uh, that was the case in the home that I came from. It might as well have been a split home from the day I was born. Even though my mom and dad were married 25 years, she was miserable for those 25 years. And I know lots of others where it's the very same way. And so hopefully that can change. Newlywed married husband said to his bride, listen up guys, why did God make you so beautiful and yet so stupid? Not a thing you ought to say to a wife. She said, well he made me beautiful so you'd be attracted to me, and he made me stupid so I'd be attracted to you. <laughs> yeah, listen, if you don't get anything else, you cannot get the best of a woman. It's impossible to do. And so you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're very careful about it. Now we are going to be looking at four essentials. I'm not sure we'll get to the last two. Uh, somewhere along the line we'll pick those up. But we're going to be looking at four essentials of a great marriage. And uh, you've got to have them. It's not a matter of whether this is my opinion or not. It comes from the Word of God, but you've got to have it. And, and if you're married right now and you're having your struggles, and please listen up. I have said this not very long ago, that if people would come to the house of God and listen to the Word of God, uh, you probably wouldn't need very much counseling at all. Because there's a lot of that that goes on right here. If you were to come to me for marital counseling, some of these things that I'm preaching here this morning, a lot of these things I'm preaching this morning, that's what we'd be going over. That's what we'd be looking at. You'd say, well, that's a church counselor. That's how they do it. 
You know, there are a couple of psychologists that are in Lexington. I won't go into who they are. But for many, many years, I've been sending people to them. Some of the people seated right here in the auditorium today have been to those counselors. They're Christian counselors. They love the Lord. You know what one of their major uh, tools is that they use to help people, not just in marriage, but in any of the problems that you go to them for? Do you know what one of the major tools is? Scripture memorization. Scripture memorization. I want to tell you, the Word of God can give you exactly what you need. We're going to start here in Matthew chapter 7 as a takeoff place, and we're going to start reading from verse uh, 24. Verse 24 down through verse 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Now, it's not necessarily what I'm going to be covering in this message, but I want you to understand that there's a lot of things you can do to try and improve a marriage. But the four things that I'm going to be bringing to your attention will probably give you about 80% of the things that you need in marriage. And I just came up with that percentage myself. I can't give you 100%. There are some marvelous marriages that are right here in our church. Some that have gone through their, their bad times, their, their hard times, and the husband and wife are still together more in love than ever before. Listen, that's how marriage ought to be. There is no such thing as a perfect marriage. There isn't. And behind closed doors where you think everything's just fine, many times things are not just fine. But I'm going to tell you, the last point of this message is conflict control. You can do a lot to help your own home. And in fact, we're going to be looking at the kids also somewhere along the line. It's not going to be right now, but somewhere along the line. You've got to work on the right things, the, the non-negotiables, the essentials, the compulsories that you must have in each and every relationship that you have. Now, the first two that, that I'm going to be bringing to your attention that I know we'll get to this morning, at least a portion of it, is the foundation. It's the foundation of a marriage. You have to have these right. You've got to have them right. If you don't, I guarantee you, even if you stay together, you're not going to have a happy marriage. And the last two, I've called it fun in the marriage, and you, you, you might wonder why. Uh, one of the things that I love about our church, when you get to know people through the years, you begin to see what it's like in their homes behind closed doors. Fun marriages. People that have a lot of fun with each other. A lot of laughter that goes on in the home. That's a wonderful, wonderful sign for home. The first two points that we're going to be looking at, listen to these, are commitment, commitment, and companionship. Companionship. And the last two that we're going to get to somewhere along the line is going to be communication and conflict control. Now let's get into this. Because commitment provides an absolute necessity that everyone must have in their life no matter who they are. I don't care who you are today. I don't care what your background is. I don't care how many degrees you got, how smart you are, how dumb you are. It doesn't make one bit of difference. Not in relationship to this. Because the bottom line is a very simple thing. These are the things that you have got to have in order to have security in a marriage. Security. Security. That's the key. Everybody wants it. People will do anything to get it. And if you're going to have it in your marriage, and by the way, a reflection of your kids in your marriage, because that's true, if they're not secure, it's going to show up in a multitude of ways and bring a lot of heartache and hardship to your own life. So you need to listen carefully to what these things are. Now, I want to bring this to your attention because I want your marriage to go the distance. Not just start good, not just be married 25 years, now i got it made. Uh, you've you got people that are right here in this auditorium who have many, 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 many years beyond that. I've been married 47 years, uh, going on 48, I think it is, or 46, going on, where are you at, Robin, somewhere. Uh, anyhow, I've been married a lot of years. And there's people in here who been married a whole lot longer than that. And they, they're doing something right. They know because they're happy in their marriage. They're happy in what's going on. Now, I, I want to give you something that's a little bit different. And you might think, well, why in the world are you doing this? Well, I want to give you what culture says. That is the society in which we live. And normally, when I go to various kinds of studies and polls that are done, I want to go to somebody who's really reliable. And I'm going to give you somebody who's not very reliable when it comes to scriptural perspectives. And why am I using it? Because what I want to bring to your attention is how the world looks at marriage today. And I know it's true. The few people outside of our church or outside of the Christian realm 
that have come to me for marriage, I always counsel with them, and, and when I tell them that I've got to counsel with them, it's not unusual when I say to them, what are you going to do in your marriage when things aren't going the way that you want them to go? I had one guy, he didn't, he didn't hesitate at all. He looked at me and said, I'll divorce her. If I don't like the way the marriage is going, I'm, I'm just going to divorce her. Can you imagine they're going into their marriage thinking if something goes wrong, we'll just get a divorce. Guess what? Every marriage has something wrong, and if he's going to follow that, he ain't even got a chance of making it. Not at all. Now, what does culture say? The world says that marriage is a temporary bond, listen to this, for as long as you both shall love. As long as you both shall love. 2012, Glamour Magazine poll. These are rank liberals. And here's what they said. 51% of the women under 30 think marriages are becoming outdated. Now, remember who we're talking about here. These are not Christians. They are polling non-Christians. They're polling people that don't care about the Word of God. They're polling people that probably don't even go to church. And 51% of them that are under 30 years old think that marriage is becoming outdated. Now, if you don't believe that that's true, I can be careful how I say this. I live in a place where I, it's, I've been there a long, long time. And I remember on my street alone when there, just about everybody on the street went to church. Now it's less than half of the people that are on my street that go to church. I can remember when it was unheard of around here that you find people that are living together when they're not married, cohabiting. And now it's just as common as it can be. It's all over the place. I have people that will come to me and they don't, they don't even make any hesitation. Well, tell me, about your, tell me about your married life. I don't know about I'm living with this girl. Are you happy doing that? Yeah, I'm, re I'm really happy. See, that, that's the world we live in. And there's a lot of Christians that are buying into that too. And then, getting back to this 2012 Glamour poll, 39% of all Americans believe that marriage has become obsolete. And again, that can be testified by people saying, hey, it's, it's a piece of paper. By the way, just to whet your appetite, there's a big difference between a covenant and a contract. And we believe in a covenant. If you got, you got married in a church and you got married before a gospel-believing preacher, he, he wanted you to understand that you're making a covenant to God as well as to the woman or to the man that you're marrying. Wedding bells are no longer needed, it says in this magazine, to have a family. Glamour magazine says that marriage is still, right now, the preferred dream. Now listen to this. But it's certainly not the exclusive dream. There are alternatives, that's what they're saying. 50, they go on to say 59% of women in America say that divorce is healthy. Divorce is healthy if two people fall out of love. Do, do you understand how diametrically opposed to the Bible that is? The instigator of marriage, the creator of marriage was God himself, and he has given to us in his instruction book exactly what works and what doesn't work. It's really important we understand this. Now, what does Jesus say? Turn over to Matthew chapter 19 for a moment, if you will. Matthew chapter 19, I want to read to you verses 5 and 6. When I say, what does Jesus say? What does Christ say? These are his words. These came from his lips. He was God in the flesh. He not only created the world, he created the institution of marriage, the institution of the home. And here's what Jesus has to say beginning in verse 5. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no longer twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder. What therefore God has joined Man shouldn't break. Now I want to say this because I, I know it always exists. What do you do when you've got people that are coming to your church, that want to belong to your church, that don't have scriptural grounds for marriage? By the way, there, there are exceptions. I believe there are exceptions that God has, and he allows a divorce. There are some people that would differ with me on that, and that's fine. A lot of people, uh, no matter what they believe, will differ on that. What do you do when they come to your church and you know it's not there? Are you, are you going to minister to them or not? Come on, you're the pastor. What, what are you going to do? 
Uh, Pastor, I've been married before. She's been married before. And we want to come to your church. Can we be accepted in your church even though we've both been married before? In fact, let me just be honest about this. There are people that have come here before that have been married multiple times and wanted to know would they be accepted. I say, yeah. I can't control everybody in the church. I'll accept you. And we will use you as far as we can use you. Now, I'm saying that because you need to understand this is always true. That when you violate God's principles and God's laws, there's a price to be paid. And, and we're not trying to be mean about it, but we want to live by what we believe the Bible teaches. And so the, we want you in our fellowship, we want to minister to you, but there are certain things that can't be done. And that's not what this message is about, so I really don't want to get into that. The point I want you to get is that it's a divine institution. So even though the world says that marriage is for as long as you both shall live, the Word of God says marriage is for as long as you both shall live, not love. What did I say on the first one? Love? As long as you both shall love. That's the world's view. That's what they do, getting into each other. It's the world's view. And when you get a Christian young man or a Christian young woman, and she starts getting serious about a non-Christian in her life, that's what you're going to be facing. There are many that have condescended to the individual that is there that they say they have fallen in love with, and they don't really believe the things that God's Word has to say, and so they're not going to live by those. And their, their relationships aren't going to reflect those. That's why I say to the young men and the young women of our church, the one thing that you ought to do when you get to a place in your life, whatever that age may be, your parents and you can figure that out, you need to make certain that you're, not, you're only going to date committed, dedicated Christians of the same faith that you are. Now, I know that's not popular. Uh, around here, I know it's not popular. You mean to tell me that you only want Baptists marrying Baptists? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Listen, kids going to come along. And you're going to have one side going to say, well, if you commit a sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Another one says, no, it's by grace. You couldn't get rid of this if you wanted to. It's all, listen, you're going to have those battles in your life. Nothing but confusion. You look around in this church at the strong families that are in this church and, and those who were kids in this church many, many years ago and now are leaders in this church, their parents taught them something. Their parents shared with them, this is what the Word of God has to say. And they believed that and accepted it and embraced it in their own heart. And that's what keeps churches strong. And we have a choice. We can choose the Word or we can choose the world. And I promise you, if you choose the world, you'll regret that. Now I want to get into this matter that I mentioned to you just a moment ago called contract or covenant. We need to have a clear understanding that marriage is a covenant to be kept, not a contract to be broken. I cannot emphasize that enough. In fact, if I can get you to see this, it's going to do a great deal to help every single marriage that's listening to me, whether it's right here in the auditorium this morning, on the radio, the television, the internet, wherever it's at. God's truth is God's truth, and it will strengthen your home. It is a covenant that should not be broken, not a contract that can be broken. Now, I want to say that as quickly as I'm saying that, that it is both. It is both. I have uh, friends in the ministry who will marry anybody of any denomination to anybody else of any denomination, or even if they're not believers. In fact, one guy in particular that's on my mind right now, and he's a good man. He really is a good man. But he sees what we do as preachers and marrying people is doing nothing more than a civil service. It should be just like one of the justice of peace down here who doesn't care what you believe about the, I, don't, I don't know who the justice of peace is, but doesn't, doesn't believe theoretically what you, where, wherever you believe the Bible. They're going to say, I can't marry you because you're, you're not marrying Baptists. Uh, they're going to marry you because they're dealing with a civil matter. A civil matter. And I uh, will say to people, usually kind of in a kidding way, but you've you got to get, get this contract, this marriage this certificate has got to be brought in here, and I've got to be able to sign it and mail it back in or get it to Donetta One because I can go to jail if I don't do that. And I laugh because I, I don't know if any preachers are thrown in jail, but it says that. You've got to have it back within a certain amount of time. And I bring that to your attention because people look at that and think, well, that's what causes the marriage. It's not. Listen, in heaven above... When I stand here with a young couple that stand in front of me or a couple that stand in front of me, and I say to them, I now pronounce, I am saying that with the authority that God has given to me. I now pronounce that you are husband and wife. No longer two, but one. And I get into some kind of a description about that. Now I'm telling you that when we stand before to be married, you stand before God, stand before church, stand before congregation. Remember that you're also standing before God. We need to keep this clear. So what's the difference between 
this matter of a contract and this matter of a covenant. The biggest difference is this. A contract doesn't require God. A covenant does. Now remember who, had, remember who came up with this whole matter to begin with. One man's idea. Man didn't come along and say, hey, this sounds good. I, I really like this girl, and so we'll get together and, and, and we'll just get married. We'll, we'll, we'll make a new thing called marriage and make a new thing called home. Uh, is that what Adam and Eve did? No, they didn't do that. God is the one who instituted the home. God is the one who said, this is how a home will operate. And when you get outside of that realm, believe me, to the extent that you get outside of that, that realm, of the home that he designed, it's not going to work. I, that's really important for us to understand because a lot of people don't want to accept that. A contract is a legal document. A covenant is when two become one. For this reason, he said. What reason? Because of the covenant that you are making. So what is a covenant? Now listen, these are little catchphrases. I always put these in my messages because I know you're not going to remember all this. So I give little catchphrases that I'm in hopes that you will remember. What is a covenant? Two become one. Two become one. I becomes we. I becomes we. Meanness becomes weeness. And when I say meanness, I'm not talking about being a mean person. Weeness. That's very important for us to know. That's why he said in Matthew 19, 6, so they are no longer two. They're one. No longer two, but one. That is a powerful, powerful statement. Covenants based on character. Has nothing to do with performance. A covenant is the merging of two hearts, two becoming one. It's the blending of two lives, two becoming one. And a covenant is a covenant because you keep it when you want to keep it, and you keep it when you don't feel like keeping it. Because you made a covenant, you made a promise. I'm going to give you some illustrations of that a little bit later on in this message. And so a covenant is a bond so strong that your mate's heart can rely on it, and your heart, child's heart can count on it too. Boy, that's powerful. I don't care what anybody tells you. I'm going to tell you something. Divorce is never good. Now, I, I, I come from a home where my mom and dad divorced after 25 years of marriage. After eight kids, nine if you count my brother Jack who died uh, before I was born. He lived, I think, four or five months. It wasn't very long that he lived. And my mom was miserable. My dad was an alcoholic, and she never knew how he was going to come home. He worked at Formica in Cincinnati, making the various things that Formica makes, and many of you know what that is. She didn't know if he's coming home with a paycheck or if he's coming home broke. She didn't know. I, I remember so many times in my life, my mother weeping in the middle of the night. I'd be in another room, but I could hear it. I, I didn't know most of the time why she was crying, but I knew she was crying. Because she knew this isn't working. Listen, my dad, my dad was brought up in church. He went to a church of God most of his life. I, from what I understand, his dad was in that church. His mother was in that church. And, and my mom's folks were in that church. They were all there. And it wasn't that they went now and then. From what I I've been told, when the preacher wasn't there, it was my dad who stood up and did the preaching. Can you imagine? And now he's a drunk. He's got eight kids who can't stand him and scared to death of him. You know, that's not what this message is about, but I, I, I want you to know I know what I'm talking about. You keep God out of your marriage, and it's going to be a mess. And your kids are going to be a mess. In Thornton Wilder's play called The Skin of the Teeth, now I read this, I, I must have gotten it from another pastor, man, it's good. Please give me your undivided attention. The skin of your teeth, the character that plays the wife says this, I didn't marry you because you were perfect. I didn't even marry you because I loved you. I married you because you gave me a promise, a covenant. That covenant made up for your faults, and the covenant that I gave you made up for my faults. Two imperfect people got married, and it was the promise that made the marriage. And when the kids came along, it wasn't the house that protected them, it wasn't even our love that protected them. It was the promise. It was the covenant that kept our kids from getting into trouble. And do you know that's exactly what the Bible teaches? That's really important for us to know because there's nothing more important than the commitment, the covenant between a man and a woman and Almighty God. Now, you'll, you'll want to write these things down. They'll be on the screen behind me, but it's very, very important. 
Three causes of divorce. Three causes of divorce. The number one reason is selfishness. The number two reason is selfishness. Anybody want to guess what number three is? Selfishness. When you marry someone, you begin to say to them, it is not a we thing anymore, it is an I thing. And you want to turn that around to say, it is we now, it is no longer I. Because it is. You no longer have just yourself to look at, you got someone else to look at too. And the only cure for selfishness is the power and the grace of God in your life. The only thing that will ever turn me-ism into we-ism is the power and the grace of God. Joe, you're going to put that, triangle, put that triangle up there for me, if you will, please. Yeah, you see that? I want you to look at that. that this really touched my heart. It's really neat how God does things. You see that triangle? That represents the institution of marriage. You've got God at the very top of the triangle, the very pinnacle. On one side, you've got the wife, and on the other side, you've got the husband. They're married. Do you notice that the closer they get to God the closer they get to each other. You see it? The closer they get to God, the closer they get to each other. Now I want to be very kind here, but I want to make certain I am not misunderstood. Some of you know that truth. You're just going to look at it and say, well, that's cute. And that's just a cute way to bring... This, this truth the cross. You know this. You know that you need to draw close to God and your marriage will get closer to God. But here's what bothers me. Many of you right here in this church with your marriage, you know what to do, but you just won't do it. You know you need to be in church, but you just won't come. And you, you think that what you're doing is a good thing. Well, listen, I don't care what the reason may be. When you develop a pattern in your life of getting away from church, you're developing a pattern in your life to get away from God. You remember, I've preached this many, many times in the past. What is one of the things that Satan does when he wants to get a person in a backslidden condition? Isolate them. Get them out of the Word of God. Get them out of prayer. Keep them away from Christians. Let them drop out of church. Because he wants to isolate them so that he can have his way with them. And there's no exception to that. I don't care who you are, that's what he wants to do. You come on Sunday morning, bless your heart. I'm so glad that you do, but I walk this tight line. Here I am balancing myself on this tight line because I want to say the right things and I want you to be in church and I want, I want God to really bless your, your marriage, but, but I see what you do. You come to Sunday morning church for about a month and then you drop out for two months. You're what I call a seesaw Christian. You're up for a few months and you're gone for three months. You're right with God for a month, you're, you're wrong with God for six months. What do you think that's going to... What would happen if you had a kid that said to you, I'll see you in six months, I'm not going to be back until then? You wouldn't allow that. Do you understand that some of you are cutting off yourself from God? If you don't get anything else out of this message, you ought to get that. And let me tell you something. Let me, listen, listen to what I'm saying. We've got so many good examples of this. And I've got this illustration that I read, and I just... <laughs> I just sat and wept. A man in a nursing home seeing his wife every day. Listen, I know I could call people out by name that I know this is going on. Every day he goes to the nursing home spending hours with his wife. His wife has Alzheimer's. She reached that point where she didn't really even know him. Plenty of them right up here in this nursing home. And sometimes she was very hostile toward him. At times she was very ugly to him. And sometimes he could do things for her and sometimes she would not let him do anything for her. Not brush her hair, not brush her teeth, not help her in any way. But other times she wouldn't have anything to do with him. And other times she would have something to do with him. He came every day. Every day he spent hours with her. Day after day. Month after month, year after year. One day the head nurse came to him and said, listen, would you come in my office? I need to talk to you. He didn't know what it was about, but he went in and she had another nurse that came in and sat at the desk. Here's what she said to him. 
All of us are so impressed with you. You come every day, and you have for months, and even for the last couple of years, and you'll spend hours with your wife, and she doesn't even know who you are. Listen, we're going to take care of your wife. You've already proved that you're the best husband on the planet. So we just wanted to free you up and to tell you you don't need to come every single day. Come any time that you want. Stay as long as you want to stay. But just know that your wife is taken care of and she doesn't know that you're not coming. She doesn't know when you're not here and she doesn't know when you are here. And the tears started running down his cheeks. And here's what he said. I know that my wife doesn't know me anymore. She doesn't know who I am. But ma'am, I know who she is. She's my wife. And 50 years ago, I promised that I would be with her in sickness and in health until death we would part. She needs me now. And I'm going to be there for her. It's a good place to stop. Do you understand that God's way works no matter what the age is, whether Alzheimer's comes or doesn't come? Listen, please hear me. You and I, we claim to be Christians. We know and we love God. And I really believe you do. I do. Oh, we have our difficulties, don't we? But that's just the nature of life. We love the Lord. Listen, God gives to us what we need to be in marriages because he loves us. And he wants us to be happy in old age as well as when we're young. I'd like to do this in our invitation. Dan, if you'll get us ready for this. There's the first thing that I want each of you to do who are married, who are married. Doesn't matter if it's a multiple marriage, if this is your fifth or sixth or whatever it is, or your first. Let's all of us recommit ourselves to each other. Now, here's what I mean by that. My wife is not here today, but I'm going to recommit myself to Donna. I love her so much. We've been married a lot of years. I don't know how many more years we're going to be married, but it will be till death we do part death we do part. Would you make that commitment to your spouse? I don't know that you need to say it right here. I mean, you do whatever you want to do, but at least do it somewhere along the line today. I meant the covenant that I made with you, the promise. The promise. I know it hasn't always been perfect, but I really love you. And I intend to stay married to you for the rest of my life. And I don't want to just be married. We didn't get to it but I want there to be fun in our marriage. Let's bow together. Now, there's a number of things I'm hoping to accomplish in this invitation here this morning. The first one is we need God so desperately in our life. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that's where the problem's at. He loves you. He really does. Believe it or not, he brought you and your wife together, your wife and you together. He did. And he will give you everything you need to make it go, go the distance. He has. You need to make a commitment to your God first. To your God first. And then the commitment to the others around you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm doing this in the easiest possible way I know to do it. What you need to do right now, if God has spoken in your heart, you really believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And you're ready to trust him as your Savior. Give him your life, and you're trusting him as your Savior. Then why don't you just stand to your feet? Jeremy's here in the front, and come and say, Brother Jeremy, I'm trusting Jesus today. And if you do that and mean it, you'll walk out of here with eternal life. You really will. I want to start there. Christians are praying for you. Members of this church are praying for you. You're lost, but you'd like to be saved. Come on.
Even if you're in the balcony, just find your way down the stairs. We'll wait for you. I'll see you come. We'll just wait. Anybody like that at all? Now, the next one that I want to address in this invitation, you don't necessarily need to come forward in the church, but you sure need to come forward with your wife or your husband. You evaluate your marriage. You evaluate it. What does it need? Is it built on a solid rock? Or is it shaken? It's about to fall. You've kept it quiet, but you've really got a problem. Now, I don't think you need to necessarily come up here. You might want to come to me afterward, but you certainly need to get with your spouse real soon. So we've got to work this out. I made you a promise. You made me a promise. That's a covenant. Now, make your mind up right now. Don't just think, well, I don't have to go forward. But you need to make your mind up before your God who sees your thoughts. And you say to him, Lord, this is the decision I'm making now, and I will go to my spouse. I will. You don't need to lift your hand. You don't need to tell us. But you need to get that marriage fixed. And only God knows how to fix a marriage. Only God. Oh, Father. As we get into this invitation, you are God and you are God alone. It's wonderful what you've done for us in giving us the institution of the home. Most of us here have found the joy of what that means. But there's some that have not. And oh, Father, I pray that your perfect will would be done in this invitation right here this morning. Because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing this together. While we're singing together, let God speak to you. Let God say to you what he wants to say. And don't reject him. God always knows best. If he loves you, he does. Do what he's telling you to do while we sing together. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that our services have been a blessing to you. Go out and serve God if you know Christ as your Savior. And if not, then realize that throughout this week, Jesus Christ will be orchestrating events in your life so that you will come to know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Join us again next week at this very same time. God bless you.